What I think this process has revealed is a deep desire for ARL to engage in collaborations of the sort that I think it has imagined before but hasn't taken the step to, mm -hmm. to do, to accomplish. Yeah, it was amazing this morning because uh, working on the systems of action was the first time we really um, took partial or fragmented ideas of what we could do and began to actually craft the system of action because as you know, as we've talked about it, um, to create a space of permission to try to um, go beyond incremental change. The more you do, I mean, you learn things, but you actually, the, the real thing there is you build the capacity to make good decisions about what you should do in the future. And, and you want to view this as an emergent process where you have to do things in order to know what to do. To look out to 2033 and say, no, it's not 2014 moving slowly forward, but let's just imagine the world in 2033. Let's build that world in all of its richness, its vastness, with some kind of coherence around a certain set of trends with the capacity to imagine what we cannot imagine in any other way. On a rail is a gaming phrase for when developers are creating large cinematic scope games. There's a perception of choice when you're playing this game. What ends up happening is they'll either design it so that the way that you want to go is left and the right is a dead end, but you remember that you had a choice even though it was made for you. The idea of on the rail information being available is an orientation of these objects of information is that there's a best way to learn and a best way to find what you're looking for. Having an on the rail system gives you that perception of choice, but you're going to learn what you're looking for the fastest way possible. There ha there's a strange balance in that. You, you, we wanted the librarian to be a subject expert, but we also wanted them to have that ability to have a profile from the user to know how to customize the content for that specific user. So it's, it's this balance of anticipating needs and, being, and, and also having an abundance of content. The future is not something that we're walking into. It's not something that's going to happen to us. It's something that we are building. My, my dilemma flipping here to just connect the dots is how do we seriously make an impact on, on improving student satisfaction <coughs> when we are in a, a true budget crunch? And that's, I'm having a hard time getting you know, we're having a hard time getting our heads around that and actually proposing concrete strategies, right, that, that can help for you that, so. Mm -hmm. And I could understand why some people at the beginning were skeptical, and I could also completely understand why later the same people said, I get this, this is really exciting, this is what we need to do. My favorite model of what, what someone called radical collaboration today, there's a choreographer, Carl Flink, who is the head of the theater arts and dance department here, and I think by some family member who was interested in ideas of chaos, he got linked up with David Adi, who is a cell biologist here. And they created a whole project where Carl's dancers, his movers, are simulating cell, cell biology movements. When Google Glass can give us information on demand, what's the role of the library relative to information? And then this idea of sense making and its provenance and, and personalization and the smart library became something that only, who else but the library, the research library? Bringing experts from different areas together into intimate groups. So like the model of a salon that is open and yet um, limited in scope for, for an individual conversation. It would build messy coherence and serendipity between people working on different things that were somehow resonant with one another. That the library can play the role of the sense-making engine in a period of unprecedented change. Absolutely. And that is the most exciting, it seems to me, possibility and challenge that we're facing. And our process not only uncovered that idea of a sense-making engine, but has led us to some ways of describing it and developing it. And we really are in an era where information is almost more valuable than, than money. The era that's as connected as this one, where all of the large problems don't reside in single disciplines. They don't even stay to their tracks of science and technology or arts and humanities. Made several years ago at Columbia that an increasing number of our students and faculty were citing web content in their research papers and uh, a growing concern that
the content that they were citing was ephemeral and was not being collected, preserved, archived, therefore throwing up core issues around, around scholarly integrity. And what was wonderful is we were able to delineate a kind of spectrum that ARL may inspire some stuff, it may actually broker relationships and then get out of the system, it may facilitate either through scaffolding or structuring or organizing, um, it may actually help begin to shape or as you said it may um, manage and begin and then create spin-offs and that's really what's wonderful this this notion of being able to see there's a different range. What we liked about these examples and a lot of us have including OSU have innovation funds is you have this organizational idea of needing to do things but then what are the tactics on the ground that actually help people start to actually achieve those examples so we were all intrigued by the innovation boot camp. Well, what I have found in my experience is that everybody has different comfort levels with change. Everybody has capacity. It's just the comfort level with change and risk. And so how, how do, d does ARL as a kind of umbrella organization begin to allow different members, different components, different directors, different people understand and find their comfort level with a kind of multitude or a series of diverse kind of components for the system of action. Just as people look back at Silicon Valley and when it started and they say that is the home of innovation. If actually people look back on the research library and say that's the home of innovation around knowledge and that it actually started here in 2013 with this process and these 319 voices, then I, I can actually see that happening from all of my interaction with this group so far. That there will be a moment when it is known as being a kind of true innovation around the kind of intellectual and, and thought-making and even culture-constructing uh, um, domain of our society. And that happened here. And maybe this will be a landmark moment mm -hmm. in the history of the association, the history of research libraries.